a pivotal time in Ukraine? The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you at part by Lookout Rhode Island and Taco Comfort Solutions. You know, kind of a dumb thing to say at the beginning, a pivotal time in Ukraine, but I'm, I'm talking about in the context of what has been the three-week onslaught from Russia. It seems with President Zelensky's address to Congress and we amping up even further sanctions and military and humanitarian support that it feels like a time when we're getting closer to continuing to answer a question that seems like we don't want to ask, and that is, you know, how far and how much uh, will our involvement be? Uh, Mark Janess is from the Naval Work College and speaks for himself uh, on this broadcast, and I, I, I always tap into Mark's um, expertise on world affairs, so he's going to share his thoughts uh, tonight on that matter. And because it's such a deep conversation, I'm going to spend less time talking about local issues. In fact, I'm probably going to skip it. Although Mark's got a bugaboo. At least he's got a, he's got a thing going on uh, on a local level and has done some testifying on, on a local issue that we will save for our, our last segment. Uh, last week we were, you know, wondering about our basketball prowess as we tape this show. We actually are taping early on a Thursday morning. We usually tape around 1245, but it's 11 o'clock on Thursday morning. You're seeing this Friday on Fox and Sunday on WPRI. Uh, it's almost like church when the PC Friars are playing in midday. It's it's like in it's like in Europe when the you know the shops shut down and everybody you know takes a nap. Instead, the shops are shutting down. Everyone's going to watch the game at 12:40. You've already seen the outcome. I'm predicting that they will move along. Bryant didn't fare as well on the Wednesday night uh, uh, effort at uh, at Dayton against Wright State, but a terrific season nonetheless. All right, uh, on the more sober. Uh, issues of the day. This is a package WPRI put together that touches base on the local aspect of this and then asks some interesting, que interesting questions. It's been three weeks of sleepless nights for Natalia Kirichenko as her heart aches for her family back home in Ukraine. Now it feels that all 40 millions of Ukrainians are my family and they even search for tickets. But her parents convinced her to stay in Providence to finish her master's program at Brown University. Distance aside, Kirichenko tells me she's doing everything she can to help. I am trying to help the uh, coordination of, of humanitarian aid to stop this terror. We need to help help Ukrainian army. The Ukrainian resident watched President Volodymyr Zelensky's address to Congress in Providence today. Despite not voting for him, Kitty Chinko tells me she was moved. We are all proud of him and we support his uh, proposals. The emotional and powerful address also hitting home with Rhode Island and Massachusetts lawmakers. I think everyone uh, in the caucus, both Republican and Democrat, uh, were really impacted by the president's words. This is truly about freedom versus autocracy, and his closing was one of the most powerful moments in my political career. Congressman David Cicilline and Jim Langevin were in attendance. They both say the U.S. needs to do everything we can to help but there's a line. Yeah, we're going to do everything we possibly can uh, short of putting troops uh, and U.S. troops on the ground. No fly zone is a declaration of war, but we should provide whatever help the Ukrainians ask for up to that point. And, and that seems just to be the challenge, right? Trying to figure out, you know, what that, what that point is going to be. Uh, good to see you, my friend. Thanks, thanks for coming in. By the way, the other program <laughs> note is it's Patty's Day week, and I'm wearing red and you're wearing blue because we're instructed not to wear green. <laughs> because if, we're, if we wear green, this beautiful set that you see behind us, just, we just sink into it. It's called chroma key. It's a whole other conversation. Uh, but happy Patty's Day week. Too. Thank you. Uh, uh, so much. I mean, there's just so much to talk about. You know, before we get into... Uh, you know, where we are with this whole thing. I was really, uh, I don't know if the word is touched, but I, I took note of that young lady's uh, suggestion that she did not vote for Zelensky, but she was proud of him. What does that mean to you? Because in America today, if you didn't vote for somebody, <laughs> suggesting that you're proud of him 
Well, I don't a, think it's a subtle difference right it, now. it takes a war to unify a country. Right. And so, you know, we have to look at it in terms of, A, how Zelensky has come through better than I think any leader of the 21st century has for, for their country, both in terms of demonstrating his bravery, his commitment to the cause, but also his eloquence. Uh, so I think even people who voted against him in Ukraine now see him as a true leader of Ukraine. I pray every day he survives. Me too. And I'm trying to figure out how in heaven's name he is surviving and how he's jumping from one place to another, I think, to, to do the videos, to do the, the yeah. any, any feeling about what kind of security he has just in terms of, is there international support for his security right now on a stealth level to keep him safe? I'm sure there is. <clears throat> but you also have to realize something else. Intel for the, the Russians to find out where he is when he is a certain place is extraordinarily difficult. And as we've seen for, for Russian capabilities, they are vastly overrated. In fact, one of the obvious things about the last 20 years is that even though Russia has gone through this famous military modernization, it is such a corrupt society that a lot of that money is now found in $600 million yachts. Uh, the apparatchiks, the oligarchs have stolen as much from the military as they have from Russian society in general. You know, it's interesting. I, I didn't ask uh, Stacy to, to, to put, put this up, but uh, I saw an interesting excerpt of Putin's presentation uh, tearing down the oligarchs, uh, literally questioning not only their humanity, but their manhood in, in some ways. There seems to be, we're going to be all over the map with this conversation, there seems to be a rift there. I mean, because in many ways you've explained to me that Putin has, has empowered the oligarchy, the economy of the upper class, as few of them as there are, and the way they've been able to establish their own richness is all him. In, in, in a sense. And now he's turning on them because some of them are what? Spitting up that maybe they don't want to see this thing anymore. Right. Look, think of Putin as a 21st century Stalin. Stalin ruled by terror. And periodically he would purge those around him who even had a potential for being his rival. And that's what Putin has done over the last 10, 15 years. He's taken down oligarch after oligarch if they didn't toe the line. So right now, the oligarchs you have in power are the ones who are most dependent on remaining in the good graces of Putin. Also, Putin's inner core is made up of the old KGB agents that he, you know, grew up with. Um, so these are the, the, the Praetorian Guard uh, that encircle him and the ultimate yes men, but they're the ones who will die for him. So when people start talking about maybe Putin will be, you know, taken out of power, <coughs> I'm a little leery of that because they never were able to do that with Stalin. And he's, Putin is very much a 21st century Stalin, which means he's not bound by ethics. He's not bound by limiting civilian casualties. He is a bad, bad man. Mm. Well, not to get ahead of myself in the conversation, but since you're talking about people dying for him to keep him, I mean, what is the end game of this whole thing? Uh, his, him stepping down, him being taken out? <coughs> Excuse me. Well, there are a couple of end games, potentially. The best scenario is that we, <coughs> we find a way for him to save face. And that could mean a formal treaty between Ukraine and Russia in which Ukraine says it will never join NATO, um, nor will it join the EU, um, and that they cede the Donbass region of Ukraine to the Russians and maybe a few other areas. And then that allows for a troop removal. Uh, Zelensky has already signaled that he would be willing to negotiate at least on part of these issues. That's the best case scenario. The worst case scenario is that Putin cannot afford to lose. And what you're seeing here is that all of their newest weapons, their precision guided munitions are already running out and they're turning to their old style uh, unguided missiles and they're either intentionally or unintentionally just leveling cities and I assume it's probably intentional. And the only way to win is what they did in Chechnya, and that is to go in there and kill and level the cities as much as possible until you compel your enemy to stop fighting. Hmm. 
All right, uh, more on this when we come back. Stay with us. It's, it's longer. Uh, that was shown with uh, Zelensky's uh, address to Congress, and it moved everybody. Look, you can manipulate a lot through video, um, but I don't see that as a manipulation. I thought that, that there was a fair, here we were, here we are. Uh, and it, it, it cuts the core. Uh, yeah. Ukrainians uh, are somewhat unknown to us, I think, in general, but uh, there's a lot of commonality in terms of how that that place is actually quite beautiful in yes. in, in, in many ways. Yep. Um, and to see it torn up like this is just is just brutal. And I, it's interesting because I think it is the one thing that maintains some level of patience with gas prices uh, amongst American consumers. Um, the, the president seems to have at least a small majority of Americans who think he's doing okay with this. So let me ask you about that because one of the things that is puzzling me not puzzling me, but you heard Congressman uh, uh, Langevin say it. You heard Congressman Cicilline say it in that package we ran in the last segment, and that is, you know, everything but everything but the no-fly zone, uh, everything but you know, boots on the ground. But my my question has been in terms of tactic. Why are we Why are we saying that? Can't we keep that as a hold? But stop saying it, because it seems like it's a green light for Putin, because he just knows that, that there's a line that we've drawn on ourselves in response to all of this. I'm not saying that we should say we might. I'm just saying, how about we not comment on it anymore? Does that make, is the question legitimate? Well, it, it, there's a philosophy of strategic ambiguity, and that means right. that the enemy, you keep the enemy off Thank balance. you for that, because I'm going to borrow that term now. No, <laughs> well, I didn't the, make it up. But, but no, but no, but that, right, strategic ambiguity, just, you know, leave him wondering if there's even that much chance. W would that impact the way this whole thing is going, or will go? Well, I say let's look at the potential stakes. I don't want the enemy to think that there's a potential to go to nuclear war because that's what World War III is. So I pr actually think the Biden administration is doing the right thing uh, because we do not want this to escalate because escalation goes from you know tens of thousands of people dying to potentially tens of millions or hundreds of millions of people dying. So I like the fact that he is being straightforward. That said, we can do a heck of a lot to bleed the Russians, to empower the Ukrainians, as they are doing right now, to fighting the Russians to a standstill. That is the responsible and the most pragmatic thing the, the Biden administration can do. And I fully, fully agree with him on that. And the President Zelensky continues to ask for more. Sure. Uh, he invoked 9-11. Yep. Uh, and, I, you know, it, it, it's, it's kind of funny. I think most Americans are probably like, hey, stay away from our 9-11. But in this particular case, with, with, the comp, with, with even that video as, as a foundational argument, I, I not only accept his, his effort, but I respect what he's trying to do and trying sure. to bring common ground you know, amongst Americans to keep the pressure on Washington to do as much as he needs to get done. But a lot of his, his requests are, and if you can't, this, and if you can't, this very right? smart <clears throat> right yeah. so uh look we're sending sending hmm. him it's called the switchblade which is a loitering munition which essentially is it's a it's a drone um and it's a it's a new technology a relatively new in the last decade that we created for our special forces and there's a 300 and then there's a 600. the 300 is an anti-personnel drone that you can carry in your backpack and then you can launch, and it goes up to two or three miles. And then there's the big one, the 600, that's an anti-armor, anti-tank weapon. So we're sending these drones that can loiter for about 20, 25 minutes and hit Russian missile systems. We can hit their tanks from far away. So we're giving them the arms they need to really wreak havoc with the Russians. And the Russians have not done well 
with their old, against the Ukrainians relying on older uh, weapons that they have in their arsenal and um, they bought from Turkey. But, but you know, who wins this battle? Who wins this battle? And to your previous point, you know, legacy and all of the issues that, that surround Putin's ego in this in this matter, never mind what his manifest destiny is for, for you know, growing Russia back in terms of geography, space, um, you know, recovering portions of the Soviet Union, facing off against NATO, all the things that he wants to get done. Um, who cries uncle? Well, look, there's an old Leninist maxim that you advance with bayonets drawn. If you encounter mush, continue. If you encounter steel, withdraw. And that was the essence of the Cold War under both Lenin, Stalin, and his predecessors. This is what's happening. In the last 10 years, we have inadvertently sent Putin the wrong message that he's going to encounter mush. Now he invades Ukraine and he encounters steel beyond anything that he imagined. So this actually... Do you actually, think he knows it? Not to interrupt. Oh, yes. Do you think he knows it? Absolutely knows it. Are, are his generals telling him the yes. truth now? There have been a lot of Russian troops who have literally quit the fight and become prisoners of war voluntarily. Uh, there are now at least 7,000 Russian casualties and probably 10 to 12,000 that haven't been reported. Can he hide that from his countrymen? Only for so long. And remember, this is an interesting, one of the biggest, most important demographics in Russia are the mo mothers of the Russian troops. And they have been very politically active in the past. So when the body bags keep coming down, keep coming back to Russia, you're going to see more and more of the mothers taking action, and that is incredibly embarrassing for Putin. And you can't arrest the mothers of the soldiers. Can't. By law, can't by no, not by law, but by, by, by political. But yeah, yeah, can't do that. Yeah, by law, he can do anything he wants. Right, and in fact, I'm I'm told in the Stalinist comparison, um, in, in my reading, I'm told that even a, a, a citizen's mention of the word war right. is arrestable. In other words, if somebody says we're at war, rather than what special operations or something like that, uh, uh, end game here. Well. Okay. Everyone wants to know this it. This is what I think is more likely to happen. It's going to turn into an insurgency. And if it turns into an insurgency, it's going to be a, a relatively long, bloody conflict. So that, to me, seems at this point... What's the difference between that, what's going on now and what's... Less conventional, more guerrilla hit and run. Because eventually, if the Russians keep pounding the cities, they will take the cities. I mean, they'll level them, but they'll take them. And they're already getting close to Odessa. So if they get Odessa on the Black Sea, they can literally turn uh, Ukraine into a landlocked country. And that means... Oh, the insurgency will come from Ukraine, you're saying? Yes, with the, you know, us aiding them through the border. And what happens to the governance of, of, of Ukraine? It's going to be horrible, long, and bloody. The only thing that we can hope for is that... But I'm talking about who, you know, who establishes authority and law. Does Zelensky run? Does he, does he, does he go to leave Kiev and, and, and head to another city to operate? It depends. It depends on how many cities the Russians are able to take. Does he survive it? We would hope. We would hope. The, look, the other scenario is that the, the Ukrainians continue to hold Kiev and a couple of the other major cities and continue to bleed the Russians. And that will make Putin more likely to negotiate. So the big question is, what does Putin do? Does he be pragmatic and negotiate and tries to save face? Or does he say, I bled too much, I'm going to take the country? Those are the t two questions that no one can answer. We'll leave it there. Uh, local issue of, uh, of my guest's concern, we'll come back. <laughs>Who's watching you? New surveillance cameras make inroads in Rhode Island, raising privacy concerns. I only have a couple of minutes here, but you've been testifying locally and on the state level about this. What is, what is your concern? I'm sure I share it. Well, my concern is that, look, I've spent a lot of time in China where there are cameras everywhere. And you literally, if you jaywalk, your picture will come up in downtown Beijing. Your picture will come up and it'll flash. So if you're a Chinese citizen, you literally will get, they'll do facial recognition, and they'll take social demerits off of, of your account. And if you get enough social demerits, you lose your job, you have all kinds of problems. And this is the kind of country that is our adversary, not our friend. We do not want to turn into 
a, a police state, a surveillance state like China is. And increasingly, no matter where you go in Rhode Island, you are being surveilled. Warwick is just putting up another 10 camera, or wants to put up another 10 cameras, and I testified against that, because once it starts, it doesn't end, it proliferates. It's for speed on the roads. Well, no, these surveillance cameras are for our security. I see. And look, Warwick does not have a bad crime warrant, right? And yet what happens here, and this is a private company called Flock, and they are working with several cities around the city, uh, the, the state, to get contracts to put up these cameras and then to run the cameras. So this is a money-making th uh, proposition on their part. I have no problem with them wanting to make money. I have a problem with us sacrificing our Fourth Amendment rights to allow Privacy. perhaps a marginal, right, a marginal increase in uh, protection and security at the expense of our right to be left alone. And the idea that government is gonna be surveilling us, look, when you're on your internet, internet Private companies surveil you. When you're on the highway, the government surveils you. When is it going to end? When I was in China originally, they had only a few cameras in the city. Now they have 200 million cameras all over China. Is that what the United States is going to end up looking like? Is that what we want to do? The whole point of the founding of this nation was to protect our civil liberties from a tyrannical government. Now we are literally empowering our local and state governments to become tyrants. When is it going to end? I don't know what the line is. We have and to I stop think it we're semi-unconscious to it. Yes, and that's one of the reasons I went to the Warwick City Council meeting, because they were voting on it without ever really thinking about the long-term political Safety, consequences. Safety, security, check. Exactly. Safety, security, and check. And the, the company, Flock, is using fear to market their cameras. All right. Uh, more on this uh, in the near future with my guest, at least on the radio. Professor, thank you uh, for pleasure. your international and local perspective. By the way, he's a China expert, so he knows of what he speaks. Final word when we come back. Uh, I have one, two, three, I'll stop counting, tickets on Newport Avenue. My average speed, eh, 30.5 miles per hour, I think I figured it out. All right. So in addition to security, this speed trap stuff, it's all part of the same conversation. Anyway, God bless Ukraine. Stay on it. We'll talk to you all week long on WPRO and back here next week. Bye.